Tonight's Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, launches the bimodal voter accreditation system in Delta State House of Assembly by election. Zamfara State Governor goes tough on bandits, declares no more amnesty. It's good news for rice farmers in Cross River State as 240 ton per day rice mill is set for commissioning. It's already two decades since the 9-11 attack and America remembers the event that changed the world. Plus, business news and sports. On business news tonight, Central Bank of Nigeria debunks plans to convert Forex in domiciliary accounts of bank customers to Naira. And on sports news tonight, Cristiano Ronaldo scores a dramatic double to help Manchester United to a 4-1 win over Newcastle United on his extraordinary Old Trafford return. We begin in Zamfara State where Governor Belo Matawale says his administration will no longer grant amnesty to bandits as they have failed to embrace the peace initiative early extended to them by his government. The governor said this during a Jamaat prayer at Dalala Mosque in Kusaw, the state capital, where he asked residents to be patient and support the new security measures put in place to flush out bandits and their collaborators for peace to reign. He adds that the bandits who are currently feeling the pressure from security agencies have sent some persons to inform him that they have repented and are embracing dialogue. He also hinted that some of the bandits are fleeing Zamfara State as a result of the suffering imposed by the new security measures introduced by the state government to cut off food, petrol supply and other essential commodities to them in their hideouts. Meanwhile, residents in Zamfara State are applauding the security measures to counter the rise in insecurity in the country. Well, some of the measures include restriction of movement, a ban on the sale of petrol in jerry cans, as well as the shutting down of telecom services in Zamfara State. The lingering insecurity in Zamfara State has prompted the state government to make stringent measures to address the problem. The measures include suspension of telecom services, closure of all primary and secondary schools in the state, suspension of weekly markets, restriction of movement of motorcycles from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Transportation of food items are subjected to verification. It is uh, not in the normal way to close for them. It's better to leave them at 10 o'clock. It's okay for those people who are far away to enter inside town. It's a welcome development cost. This is the only way that the government can use to tackle the insecurity within short a period of time. So I think this major taking will be a great and valuable to the people of the state. The consensus is that residents should support the security operatives in implementing the new measures. Everybody they talk about the people, they disturb, women they disturb them, they, allow, they don't allow them to move. They give them move, they no movement of the machine, no movement. Something down doesn't mean if we have peace, so we can enjoy everything. So we are making everything normal. So we are happy with all these things that government brings to us. According to the state government, about 184,000 households have been affected by banditry in the state, while the number of internally displaced persons have risen above 600,000 in the state. However, the government believes the majors have improved the security situation. The chief of army staff, Lieutenant General Farouk Yahaya, who relocated to the state about three days ago, have been combing the forests and the bandits' enclaves all over the state and are dealing with the bandits. The efforts by the military have been a huge success. The Zamfara State government introduced the new measures and the residents are hoping that the new security measures will bring an end to the menace and restore peace, security and stability in the state. Away from security to election matters, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has deployed the bimodal voter accreditation system for the first time for the Isoko South Constituency 1 Delta State House of Assembly by election. 
In some polling units, the device was reported to be efficient. Capture and fingerprints of voters, and where that failed, faces were captured before voting could take place. In some other polling units, however, the reverse is the case, as the device could not capture their details. The INA commissioner in charge of the Isoko South constituency, Mayor Gbamuchumba, is however assuring voters that the issues will be resolved. Before the election, INEC distributes sensitive materials from the premises of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Asaba, for the by-election holding in Isoko South Constituency 1, Delta State House of Assembly. The by-election is to fill the vacant seat at the State House of Assembly following the death of a former member. At this polling unit, Voting and accreditation is going on at the same time as the device appears to be efficient, capturing fingerprints of voters and where that fails, their faces are captured before any individual can cast his or her vote. The candidate of the PDP, Ovoa Poye Evivi, arrives to cast his vote, commending the Independent National Electoral Commission. With what I saw here now during my voting, uh, I think the process is fast and it's unique, it's simple, like the other ones before. The APC candidate speaks to the conduct of the polls. From what I've observed, you know, it's been free and uh, fair. Unfortunately, in some other polling units, the reverse is the case. To tell us that this election they are trying to test run the machine and what we are seeing here, the machine is not getting, we are not getting it right. Expressing optimism that the usefulness of this method will be very visible during the forthcoming Anambra governorship election, INEC insists that such challenges are expected, being the first time the device is being deployed. And when you're starting with something new, you've got to do it with care and with understanding and for me, I feel that by the time this exercise is over and done with, we should be, I'm confident we should be able to use it for the Anambra election. Meanwhile, the Delta State Police Command has confirmed that a vigilante was hit by a stray bullet, while sporadic gunshots were being fired by unknown gunmen who invaded a polling unit in Iri, near Ole, headquarters of the Isoko South local government area. Elsewhere, aggrieved members of the All Progressives Congress in Jemaa local government area of Kaduna State have taken to the streets to protest against the inconclusive declaration of election in the council by the State Independent Electoral Commission. The APC members who took their protest to the Office of the Electoral Commission in the state capital vowed to resist any attempt by the electoral umpire to declare the election inconclusive or conduct a rerun election, insisting that the entire process was duly completed and winners returned by the returning officer. On Friday, the chairman of the State Independent Electoral Commission, Saratu Dikuadu, declared elections in Jema and three other local governments as inconclusive on the grounds that election did not hold in some wards in the local governments. On the 4th of September, the Kaduna State Independent Electoral Commission, Katsikum, conducted elections in 19 of the 23 local government councils in the state. One week after the exercise, the dust is yet to settle on the election in Jamal local government area. <laughs> Members of the All Progressives Congress in the area are questioning the rationale behind the decision of the state electoral umpire to upturn the result in which the returning officer declared Yohanna Barade of the APC the winner of the chairmanship poll. Yohanna Marcus Barade. The joy of that victory was short-lived as the chairman of Katsikum, Saratu Diku Audu, on Friday listed Jamal local government and three others as places where elections were inconclusive on grounds that nothing happened in some wards in the local government. Not happy with the decision, agreed members of the All Progressives Congress in Jamal local government area took to the streets of Kaduna state capital protesting against the declaration of the election as inconclusive, demanding for an immediate reversal. We are collectively shocked, disappointed and dismayed 
by the calculated mischief, partisan afterthought, and shameless attempt to commit a day, daylight robbery of the hard-earned victory of our great party, the All Progressive Congress of Jamaa Local Government. From the streets, they marched to the headquarters of the Kaduna State Independent Electoral Commission with placards bearing different inscriptions to see the chairman of the commission, whom they accuse of deliberately trying to truncate the people's mandate. We wish to remind the SICOM in case they have forgotten the provision of Section 23 from the Supreme Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. We state clear that after the returning officer pronounced, returning officer of a local government have pronounced that a winner has been elected, there is no way another story will come up from the SICOM order from the returning officer. Our demands are that our mandate should be sustained. We were declared, the election was declared free and fair by the um, returning officer of the local government, the of the Do Do Dr. Sunday Ibrahim, the, 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 in front of PDP, and they accepted it. Everyone accepted, and we all shook hands. For now, Katsikom is yet to respond to the issues and concerns raised by these aggrieved APC members. But they say they will be left with no option other than to take legal action should the commission fail to reverse itself on the matter. Education is one of the sectors mostly affected by the insurgency in Borno State. And as a universal basic education intensifies strategies with education partners to get out of school children enrolled, Continuity is another problem the government must now deal with. The special report takes a look at the situation in Bornu State, where widows now have to take up jobs as laborers to keep their children in school. Young adults languish in a camp for internally displaced persons in Meiduguri, the Bornu State capital. After seven years of displacement, most of them have completed their primary education in the camp but well, there is no provision for further studies. Families are more concerned about how to make earnings to complement whatever food supply the government provides. There are 8,000 displaced persons from Monguno local government area living in this camp. After eight years of waiting, some parents have now resorted to enrolling their wards in town. Parents and the children must now put in extra hours at work to earn, as there is school fees and daily transport fare to be paid. The very low, this is like Babu. Transportation, Subabansu Anabia. Um, school fees, Subabansu Anabia. Registration, Baba Yalang Anabia. I'm a secondary one, I'm a secondary one. At least 400 children from Monguno local government alone attend secondary schools in Meiduguri Township, funded by their parents. The less fortunate kids hang around the local market within the camp, scavenging or engaging in other menial activities to support their families. Elsewhere in another camp, some of them attend the non formal accelerated learning classes to refresh their knowledge, hoping to be enrolled into mainstream schools. Launched in 2018 by education partners, the project has helped to create more safe educational environments for girls and boys. Statistics have shown that the Northeast and the Northwest have been behind with a lot of out of school children even before the crisis. But like you rightly said, the crisis has further, you know, compounded that and a lot of them on the street. And so when you set up a related program, it gives opportunity for access for children who, one, out of poverty, don't, will require uniform to go to a former school. 
So a accelerated learning program gives opportunity for kids to come as, as the way they are. Before help comes, parents, mostly females, forced by the conflicts to hedge their families, will continue to show up here daily to join other laborers in search of menial jobs to pay their bills. In part two, after the break, we seek answers to questions raised by that report. We'll be joined by Borno State's Commissioner for Education. Join us again. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on Channel's television, Lagos. As a reminder of our top stories. Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, launches the bimodal voter accreditation system in the Delta State House of Assembly by election. Zamfara State Governor goes tough on bandits, declares no more amnesty. It's good news for rice farmers in Cross River State as 240 ton per day rice mill is set for commissioning. It's already two decades since the 9-11 attack and America remembers the event that changed the world. We're still staying on the impact of insurgency on education in Borno State. We're now joined on the news at 10 by Borno State's Commissioner for Education, Mr. Lawan Wakube, uh, to give us some more answers to questions raised in that report. He joins us from our Borno studio. It's great to have you on the news at 10. Well, uh, it's quite sad to see children of post-primary school age barely having access to secondary education in all seven official IDP, IDP camps in Maiduguri. Uh, can you tell us why is that so? All right. Thank you very much for having me. First of all, what I want you to know is that uh, an emergency can only be classified as a disaster when it exceeds the coping capacity of the system. The insurgency, which has lasted for 10 years, had like 2 million people displaced at its peak, hundreds of thousands of children out of school, and about 56,000 orphans. This has become a major source of concern to His Excellency Professor Babagana Umara Zulum, Executive Governor of Borno State, when he took over office. So His Excellency had a two-prone solution to this problem. One is to cite day technical secondary schools in areas where the IDP camps are located. An example is one of the schools commissioned by Mr. President on the 17th of July. One will ask why technical. It is His Excellency's vision that after fulfillment of basic education, the children that will be enrolled from IDP camps into those schools will have relevant technology which will develop their skills and give them self-reliance. Two, there are children that are completely overgrown. They grew up in those camps and they had no access to school. So what the Borno State Government is doing is to enroll them into their numerous into our numerous vocational enterprise institutes. And uh, this will now give them an opportunity for a kind of non-formal training in numerous skills. Well, clearly this is still a major challenge. I mean, in spite of some of those measures which you have reeled out. So how serious exactly is this situation in the IDP camps? And just how many children are currently attending classes? Well, uh, I don't have an accurate figure of, for now, but uh, there are numerous schools. But you have to understand also that the Borno State Government has also done its own effort to improve access and mainstreaming. In the last two years, it has built 16 mega schools of 60 and 30 classroom capacities, built 432 classrooms in 48 schools, and has rehabilitated 39 schools, all in a bid to create more access and mainstream this children you are talking about in numerous IDP camps. So if you could just um, give us an insight into future plans, because listen to some of those children, they clearly have a desire to go to school and clearly it's, 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 it's not working out. So with the current resettlement drive of the Borno State Government, what is the education plan for these conflict-affected children, particularly those ones that, as I speak now, do not have access to that education? Well, like I said, so many schools have been built, so many schools have been rehabilitated. 
all in a bid to create a kind of second chance for them so that they will be able to continue with their schools where it's, it has been disrupted. But you have to understand that there are those of them who are above school age. And like I said, our plans for such children is to enroll them into our various vocational training programs so that they will have the desired skills so that they could have a second chance even through the blue collar job line. Well, Mr. Lawan Wakilbe, the Borno State Commissioner for Education, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us on the news at 10. Well, here in Lagos, as construction work resumes on the first phase of the Lagos Blue Light Rail projects from Maltu to Marina, as well as the commencement of work on the red line from Agbado to Ido, the Lagos State Government says it is confident about the completion and deployment of both lines by the last quarter of 2022. While this Lagos Rail Mass Transit is expected to bring soccer to Lagos residents when operational, a correspondent Chris Limps brings an update on the state of work done so far. Commuting in Lagos, a city of well over 20 million people, primarily on the existing road network, could be difficult and has obviously been a matter of concern to the state government. In order to tackle the associated challenges headlong, the Lagos Rail Mass Transit to be managed by Lamata was conceived. The essence is to keep fewer vehicles on the road, with Lagosians encouraged to use the rail services. So the blue, red, green, yellow, brown, purple and orange lines are proposed to make up the Lagos urban rail system. The blue line, designed to connect Okokomaiko to Marina, was meant to be completed and deployed for use by 2011. However, this could not be achieved, largely due to paucity of funds. With the project back on track, to make the first phase a success, construction work is ongoing at the marina end of the network, where a terminal is also set to be constructed. You would see that uh, the National Theatre Station is built, and uh, the beams and all of the inf civil infrastructure coming out of there is also implemented. And from roundabout to Butero, you will see that the, the beams have no, or the piers have no beams on it. And that's what we're doing now to ensure that the civil infrastructure is completed, the, road, uh, the rail lines will be put on it, and all sorts of other infrastructure that will support the operation are also being done. For now, the terminals and tracks within the 13-kilometer corridor with a 5.5-kilometer elevator route are waiting to be exploited. With the blue light rail panning out right, the 37-kilometer red rail connecting Agbado to Marina, which is leveraging the existing Nigerian Railway Corporation Lagos Ibadan standard gate line, is taking shape. Before now, we have uh, 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 an, an agreement that why the National Rail will do two tracks, they will do two tracks. But as fund is becoming difficult to get, we have to collaborate and say, oh, why, wait, why, why don't you uh, run the mass, uh, the mass transit? Why we run the long distance and the freight? So if you look, that beautiful station, that iconic station that the federal government has built, that's where their own rail line will stop. From that location, Lagos State is building a dedicated line all the way to Ingo. In order to guard against incidents of gridlock owing to movement either by road or rail, several overpass have been constructed along the Red Line corridor, one of which is here at Ikeja bus stop, not too far from a major Lagos bus terminal. We've also built the Penn Cinema Bridge, is another one that actually crosses the rail. So from Lagos State's perspective, we've done, we would be doing five of them. The rest of them will be done by the federal government. The only thing that holds up a, any project, apart from unforeseen ground conditions or whatever, is always money. And for these two projects, we have the funds to complete both, at least for the phases that we have committed to. When the first phase of both lines are completed, 
It is expected that over 800,000 passengers will be moved daily. While the Lagos state government is set to deliver on a functional and workable transport system, Lagos residents are enjoined to be cautious and exercise a little more patience till the last quarter of 2022 when operations are meant to begin. Chris Elems, Channels Television News. From transport to food production, this time in Cross River State where Governor Ben Ayade is satisfied with the smooth test run of a rice mill factory located in Ogoja, northern senatorial district of the state. Speaking in Ogoja local government area while inspecting the factory ahead of commissioning, the governor disclosed that the dream of having a rice milling factory in Ogoja is gradually becoming a reality as a mill is now set for commercial purposes. Located in Ogoja local government area of Cross River State is the Rice Mill Factory, one of the signature projects of Governor Ben Ayade aimed at boosting the state's internally generated revenue as well as diversify the state's economy. The factory has the capacity to produce 1,600 tons of rice daily to meet the state's demand and also enough to supply to other states. Ahead of the commissioning, Governor Yade is at the site for an inspection. He says the facility will, among other things, create an automatic market for farmers. I'm particularly delighted and I look forward to converting the entire Cross River State into rice farmers because the storage capacity alone for one batch is about 6,500 tons. And on continuous production, we have a stock capacity of 240 tons per day at 24 hours operation. So if we have 240 tons per day, it gives you an idea that even if we were to convert the whole land in Cross River State for rice farming, this factory will have the capacity to take it. The mill is now at an advanced stage and ready for commercial operations. After now, we'll have to go into a commercial operation where we'll uh, uh, start selling the rice uh, to the public. And we are, we are at that point now. Uh, because this is a 10 tons an hour um, capacity rice, and uh, invariably we run at full capacity. We'll be milling uh, 240 tons per day. And uh, we believe we don't have enough parties to satisfy, uh, to meet the demands of this plant. The Ogoja Rice Mill Factory is expected to boost food production, wealth creation, and provide job opportunities for the people of Cross River State. Effective Monday, September the 13th, all business activities in a number of states must be in top gear, including bank operations and transportation. Governor William Albiano gave this order during a critical stakeholders meeting Good with members everybody. of the State Security Council, heads of financial institutions, leadership of markets and the transport division, among others. Governor Albiano describes the continued compliance with the indigenous people of Biafra's sit-at-home order by the drivers of the various sectors of the economy across the state as totally unacceptable. This order is affecting our economy. And the economy, and uh, we will not allow it to continue. And I'll be taking some far-reaching measures to ensure that that doesn't happen, so that my people can go about their business. You know, banks can go about their, uh, their work, transporters can go about their business, market people, everybody. You know, um, things are tough. And we shouldn't add to the tough times by uh, heeding to, uh, you know, calls that are not economically progressive. We are going to deploy extra security. We have many police men here already. Civil defense, uh, army, navy. We have plenty of them now, and you'll be seeing them uh, all around the places. The market is not open. If it's not open, if it's not open, I will sack the leadership of that market that you know, immediately and close down the market. The commissioner is here. 
Madame Sura Sabana, c'est à toi. Où c'est, c'est à toi. Je donne l'homme. When the news at 10 returns, Assistant Inspector General of Police seeks collaboration on security. Stay with us. Men of the Southwest Security Network, Amotekon Corps, have rescued the remaining three of 12 travelers that were kidnapped by gunmen along the Akokoi Doani Road. The 12 victims were traveling from Abuja to Lagos when they fell into the hands of the kidnappers. The commander of Amoteku in Ondo State, Mr. Ditunji Adileya, says the kidnappers fled and abandoned their victims as the security officials closed in on them. After we were able to secure the release of the first nine, our operatives still continued in the forest and uh, we were combing the forest. You agree with me that it's so massive because the same forest that uh, extends to parts of Kogi. So we started tracing them and once they started maintaining contact with their families, we also started tracing and tracking up to the point of when we now gave them very hot chase. So to the glory of God, we were able to secure their release. For now, we have not made any arrest, but we are tracking and we are working on them. A lot of things like the tracking that I told you about is being done. We are being assisted by the DSS. The police also backs us up. In the, it's a synergy of all security agencies. We are only taking the lead. Well, it's time for business news. And here's Tenyola Shabali. Welcome to Business News. The Central Bank of Nigeria says it has no plans to convert Forex in domiciliary accounts of bank customers to Naira as a way of checking the dollar scarcity in the country. The CBN made this known today in a statement stressing that the forced speculation aims to cause panic in the foreign exchange market. Meanwhile, the Apex Bank has warned deposit money banks to observe due diligence in the processing of foreign exchange transactions or risk losing their FX operating license for at least a year. Now, the total turnover of transactions carried out at the FX spot forwards and futures markets for the week ended September the 10th declined by 17.07% to $876.91 million from $1.05 billion reported in the previous week. However, $168.2 million worth of FX futures contracts were traded, representing a week-on-week -week increase of $164.87 million when compared to $3.33 million traded in the previous week. Total value of Forex traded at the investors and exporters window of the Forex market fell by 17.25% to $520.77 million week to date. On the other hand, the Naira rose slightly against the dollar by 0.01% at the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange window to 411 Naira 25 Kobo. Meanwhile, at the parallel market, the Naira was down against the dollar uh, by 1.10% at an average exchange rate of 532 Naira to a dollar compared to 526 Naira 20 Kobo recorded in the previous week. The domestic stock market closed bearish in the second trading week of September, down by 0.86% due to sell-side pressure. However, performance on the activity chart was mostly positive, as 1.43 billion shares changed hands for 13.07 billion naira in over 19,300 deals. Meanwhile, sectoral performance closed mixed for the week, with the oil and gas index being the biggest advancer, up by 2.28%. Oando topped the gainers chart by 14%. Conestone Insurance led the laggards for the week, down by 15.79%, while the trio of First Bank, Access Bank, and Wemma Bank were major contributors to the total volume of shares traded 
this week. Meanwhile, activities at the unlisted securities market ended the week positive as both the NASD OTC security index and market capitalization increased by 0.40%. At the same time, NASD investors gained 2.59 billion naira in value, taking the market capitalization to 641. 0.34 billion naira this week, in contrast to 638.75 uh, billion naira recorded on Friday, September the 3rd, as a result of positive movements in prices. The total value traded during the week rose by more than 1,000% as the market recorded a total of 1.11 billion naira compared to 95.43 billion naira recorded in the previous week. Also, total volume of securities traded increased by 69.94% to 10.26 million units, with Nigerian Exchange Group PLC ranking top among the five most traded uh, securities by volume. NASD PLC led the advances for the week, while Food Concepts PLC led the losers. Let's cross over to the fixed income market where trading in the secondary bonds market closed the week with mixed sentiments. This follows the higher treasury bill stop rates amid investors' less aggressive cherry-picking activities. Buying interest was seen at the short and mid-dated instruments while holders of the long tenor bonds are repriced upward. The overall average benchmark yield rose by five basis points to 11.1% week on week. At the Treasury bills market, trading activities turned bearish following market participants' reaction to the increase in the stop rate of the long-dated instrument at Wednesday's NTB primary market auction. At the close of the market this week, the average yield for Treasury bills rose by 30 basis points to 4.9%, while open market operations bills were up by 10 basis points to close at 6.2%. And that's business news tonight. I'm Tenyo La Shubawale. It's back to Kayade for the rest of the news at 10. Thanks, Tenyo La. And for the latest sports stories, let's join Kayode Alayade. Many thanks, Kaede. Welcome to Sports News. Novak Djokovic is just one win away from a record 21st major title that will also earn him entry into tennis' most exclusive club. If Djokovic defeats the second seed Daniel Medvedev of Russia in the U.S. Open final in New York on Sunday, he will complete a calendar year Grand Slam of Australian Open, French Open and Wimbledon to earn a place alongside Don Budge in 1937 and Rod Lava in 1962 and of course 1969. Djokovic currently in a three-way tie for winning most men's tennis major titles at 20 each will, with Roger Federer and Rafael Nadal will overtake his rivals in the number of Grand Slam trophies he wins if he wins on Sunday. The Serbian won his first Grand Slam title at the Australian Open in 2008. Meanwhile, in the English Premier League, Cristiano Ronaldo has enjoyed a dream return as a Manchester United player with a double as the Red Devils thrashed Newcastle United 4-1 at Old Trafford. Champions Manchester City secured a third straight league win after seeing off Leicester City at King Power Stadium. Romelu Lukaku scored his first and second ever goal at uh, Stamford Bridge to help Chelsea return to winning ways with a 3-0 triumph over Aston Villa. Arsenal lifted the pressure of manager Mikel Arteta as they secured their first point with victory over Norwich City at Emirates Stadium. Oz uh, Odson Edouard scored twice on his debut as Crystal Palace claimed their first win of the season. And Huang He Chan scored on his debut as Wolverhampton Wanderers got their first goals of the season 
in a victory over Watford. Meanwhile, Manchester United manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has appraised Cristiano Ronaldo after the ruthless and clinical goal scorer backed a double on his Red Devils return. Solskjaer says he never doubted Ronaldo will uh, have an immediate impact on his homecoming. Manchester United have won three and drawn one of their first four fixtures and sit top of the table. The atmosphere has been electric around the club. Uh, the, the supporters have uh, really enjoyed the last, uh, yeah, say, 10 days or so since he signed. And um, there was loads of expectations, obviously, uh, this afternoon on, on the team and on him. The, the big thing about him is he senses the big moments. He knows when to arrive in the box and when to run in behind. And I thought he played the game very uh, mature, uh, simple, didn't give too many balls away. Uh, I think he gave one away, one. But he was um, very efficient with his uh, football. He does what he does. Cristiano, he lifts everyone. He gets everyone's, everyone so focused when he's in and around the place. He puts demands on himself, which then will put demands on, the, on his teammates. And he puts demands on us. Elsewhere, Brazilian club Sao Paulo have parted ways with Dani Alves after the veteran defender skipped training in protest over unpaid wages. The former Barcelona, Juventus and Paris Saint-Germain players' advisors told the club his training boycott will continue until his outstanding salaries were paid. Reports say Alves is owed 1.8 million euros. Sao Paulo's sporting director Carlos Belmonte says the club recognizes the debts and tabled an offer which was rejected. The most decorated player in history joined Sao Paulo in 2019 on a three-year contract. And that will be all on Sports News. Back to Ikadi. Thank you, Coyote. On this day, 20 years ago, the world stood still, watching in horror and disbelief as a series of terrorist attacks killed almost 3,000 people in the United States. The attacks by Al-Qaeda militants at the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and on United Airlines Flight 93 were a defining moment in millions of lives. 20 years after, people still pause to remember the event of that day with ceremonies held across the world. This year's anniversary comes shortly after the end of the U.S.-led war in Afghanistan to root out Al-Qaeda. The ceremony at the September 11 memorial in New York City began with a moment of silence at 8.46 a.m. local time, the exact time the first of two planes flew into the World Trade Center's Twin Towers. Stephen Paul Lefkowitz. Relatives then began to read aloud the names of the 2,977 victims. Many struggled to hold back tears at the ceremony. President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden were joined by former U.S. Presidents Bill Clinton and Barack Obama, as well as former First Ladies Hillary Clinton and Michelle Obama. In Pennsylvania, George W. Bush, who was the U.S. President at the time of the attacks, and Vice President Kamala Harris were among those who paid tribute to the heroic passengers of Flight 93, who prevented their hijackers from taking control of the plane, preventing another target from being hit. At the Pentagon, outside Washington, a moment of silence was held at 9.37 a.m., the moment when American Airlines Flight 77 struck the west side of the Pentagon, killing 184 people. The remembrances have become an annual tradition, but this year has special significance, coming 20 years after the morning that many view as a turning point in U.S. history. 
a day that gave Americans a sense of vulnerability that has deeply influenced the country's political life since then. Washington, D.C. correspondent Maria Bird has been speaking to survivors and families of those lost, and they say the pain of 9-11 can never be forgotten. It's been 20 years since 9-11 and the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were under attack and the lives of Americans were changed forever. Survivor Gail E. Mitchell remembers the day. When I exited the door and I looked up at like everyone else, Tower One had been hit, and that's where I worked. I actually worked on the 88th floor of Tower One. As I exited the building, I looked up. I said, oh, my goodness, what on earth happened? 9-11 marked a life change for Raymond Sanchez Jr. as his father was a victim of the 9-11 attack. Uh, there was a lot of growing up real fast. Um, and because of it, you know, I made, you know, uh, choices, whether it was to go to law school or buy a house, you know, things that I was doing at 22 and 23 that I didn't normally wouldn't have been doing, but for the fact that my dad passed away and I was trying to figure out how to do the most responsible thing. What doesn't get talked about once people don't know is that, uh, my dad could have got, got, could have gone out of the building. Uh, it was that fact that he turned around to go look for his apprentice who he didn't, who he lost contact with, he didn't know where he was, that my dad got chopped in the elevators and, and, and didn't make it out. And 20 years later, it's still a trauma. Uh, the 9-11 attacks were a first for modern American history. So was the American response with the declaring war on terror. This resulted in a 20-year war in Afghanistan. Americans that were directly impacted by the attacks believe that it may have been time to withdraw. I do believe it was time. Um, we sacrificed so many lives there for a reason, but I thought it was time. Could it have been done differently? Maybe, maybe not. The attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon stole the souls of Americans, but the memories and the future of the U.S. is bright. From Washington, Maria Bird, Channel Television News. So let's get more on the significance of this day and how well America has fed since September. Uh, 11, 2001. We're joined on the news at 10 by Joanna LeBlanc. She is a national security law and foreign relations legal expert joining us from Washington, D.C. Thank you for joining us on the news at 10. Well, it's been 20 years since that terrorist attack on American soil, but it appears time has not healed that wound. Certainly not. Um, you're talking about over 100 um, and 70,000 lives lost um, in total um, as a result of 9-11. Of um, and over $2 trillion have been spent. Um, so we certainly, the American people certainly, will never forget 9-11 and the uh, impact of 9-11 on American lives, when you go to the airport, uh, when you engage in just normal activities, how lives have changed and also how the laws have changed here in America pertaining to um, some of our domestic affairs and even how we engage with the international community. And, you know, for you, what, what would you say are the lessons that have been learned, not only from that attack, but from the fact that 20 years after, the world is still not exactly a safe place. Well, first and foremost, um, I think it's incredibly important to kind of um, set the stage in terms of the legal, the legal um, basis um, for um, those we have, the U.S. has detained in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, who are supposed to be responsible for 9-11. So um, under the um, authorization for use of military force, Act, which was passed by the United States Congress, it gave 
um, the U.S. government the authority to detain those individuals in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Um, and also it gave um, the United States the, um, the, the, the military the authority to go after all those who are perpetrators of war crimes against the United States government. Um, so some of the lessons that I can tell you that should have been learned um, throughout for the past 20 years is, one, um, you need an inclusive approach to fighting terrorism. So you have to include our uh, the faith communities. You have to include the government. You have to include NGOs. Um, you have to include all sectors of society because it is in the moments of vulnerability that terrorist groups thrive. So even in Nigeria, when you look at Boko Haram, Boko Haram is not in Lagos or Abuja. It's in the northern region of, of Nigeria where has been severely neglected by the Nigerian government, at least some, some claims, some will argue, um, right? So, so we have to look at our human rights and also good governance um, and combine the two in order for us to truly address terrorism. And, and, and secondly, one last point I would like to make is, is that uh, um, I think 9-11 evokes a certain level of fear in people about certain groups of people because of how they look or how they speak. And I, and I pray that 9-11 taught us that uh, uh, we, we should not be biased um, um, due to the way people, people look. Uh, we need to check our implicit biases all over the world. Well, Joanna LeBlanc, it's been great hearing your thoughts on this one. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Also on security, but back here in Nigeria, the police in Cross River State is calling on residents to collaborate with the command to tackle security challenges in the state by providing useful information. The Assistant Inspector General of Police in charge of Zone 6 Command says the force is working on improving its visibility across the state to give the citizens the opportunity to reach out to them, especially during emergencies. I want to first and foremost thank the state government for what it has been doing. They have, done, they have been doing quite a lot. So I want to say that I have come to encourage them to do more. I have come for them to sustain what they have been doing also. So I'm also calling on the people of Cross River State generally to give us that support, to, give them, to be ready to come up with information. The CP's phone, my own phones are 24 hours open. So we need information to act uh, quickly. So I'm calling on all the citizens of this state to partner with us and to look at us as friends so that we can make this place safe for everybody. My strategy will be that I will, I will, I will have to come together with the CP to see how we can do it better how we can, you know, create more visibility of policemen on the streets so that people, by mere seeing patrol, by mere seeing them, at least people will uh, be happy with themselves and will not have that fear. They will sleep with their two eyes closed, let us say so. And the main news again. The Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, deploys the new bimodal voter accreditation system in the Delta State House of Assembly by election. Also today, American citizens all over the world stood still to remember 20 years of the terrorist attack of 9-11, which shook the world to its very foundation and changed the course of history. And that's the news at 10 on behalf of the team. Thank you for watching and good night.